as people begin to transition back to the office, either permanently or semi-permanently in a temporary or shared workspace, we'll be faced with the unique challenges to achieve the same safety and comfort we know is critical at the workstation, either at home or at the office before. So that'll be uh, April 8th. Just a little bit of housekeeping for today. Uh, at the bottom of your screen, you can put some questions that you have as we go through this presentation. It will be interactive. We are gonna be incorporating Menti into today's presentation as well. So if you go to menti.com on your phone, the code is in the chat section there as well. Today's presentation is gonna be recorded. You can request a copy of the recording. We don't send out the actual presentation itself, but you can request a copy of the recording on our website 48 hours after this, this finishes. Just bear in mind that um, you can't get a CEU credit for watching the recording. You gotta, you gotta watch it live. Um, as far as our, our, our timing will go today, we'll spend about 45 minutes, or sorry, 50 minutes in the topic. It's gotta be 50 for the CEU with 10 minutes of questions. And before I hand it over to our speaker today, Annette out of New Jersey, we're getting international speakers. In the last couple of months, we've had uh, London, Los Angeles, uh, Toronto, New York. Now we're here with our speaker from New Jersey. Uh, and Annette has uh, been in the design office furniture industry for 25 uh, plus years, first as a designer, then in manufacturing sales. She's practiced interior design in the UK, Germany, and the United States, focusing on commercial interiors before joining the furniture industry as architecture and design market manager. And that's design background, coupled with a passion for workplace and her experience in the office furniture industry led her to her present role. And that facilitates and engages customers on topics that includes visioning, co-design, change planning, innovation, and workplace effectiveness. As part of Technion's CEU faculty, she's also a seasoned presenter of several CEU presentations related to workplace strategy, including the Jetsons, the Focus Game, and today's presentation, The Discovery Dilemma. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Annette. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Or I should say, I guess it's it's just afternoon for you. Um, we're coming up on three o'clock here on the East Coast. And it's just such a pleasure to be with you. And I'm just blown away by the attendance that you have. So um, welcome. And we're going to go on a little bit of a journey together as we talk, talk about problem solving. And before we dive into that, and I'm just about, I'm going to share my screen with you right this second. But before doing that, uh, it would be helpful if you have a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil handy, because there are going to be a number of exercises that we are going to do together. It is very much an interactive uh, workshop. So paired, there'll be some analog elements to it, as well as things that you can do with Menti. So uh, without further ado, I shall now share my screen with you. Here we go. And uh, Tracy, can you give me a thumbs up? You can see it. Great. Yes. Thank you so much. So the code that you'll need to type into your phone is 12297243. And once you hop get onto the mentee, if you could just either hit one of those icons, either the heart or the question, if you have a question, the question mark um, or thumbs up, that would be great. That'll give me an un understanding of how many people are actually logged on. We have 44 people, 47 so far on the call. So I'm gonna be looking for a good number of folks on the, on the Mentimeter. Great, thank you. And certainly if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those at the end of um, the presentation. If you can just put them into the chat box, that would be fantastic. Thank you. All right, well, let's move along here. So, all right, so the discovery dilemma. Let's face it, within the last year, we've been asked to tackle some really big, big questions and solve some really big, big problems. And I think we can all relate to that. Um, and in doing so, there's a lot of pressure being put on us to come up with creative ideas. And we are finding it increasingly more difficult to become inspired and come up with these new ideas and to solve very complex problems. Often when we're faced with a complex problem, we tend to jump to the solution, but we may exclude a critical part of the creative problem solving process. And for those of you who are designers, something that is very familiar to you is of course discovery. 
So through this interactive workshop, designing thinking principles are going to be applied, bringing the discovery process to life. Simple and effective tools used to define and solve complex problems are shared throughout the presentation. The next series of engagements and conversations that we'll have are meant to be used in any context when problem solving is necessary. We will use the workplace as a bit of a foundation to eliminate how these tools are used. However, know that they can be applied to really any, uh, any subject. So without further ado, let's jump right into our very first exercise. And my, what I'd like you to do on your Mentimeter is I'm gonna give you about a minute, which is impossible to come up with a thousand uses for a paperclip. So just jump right on in. So you may enter more than once. So certainly enter as many things that come into your mind as possible. Okay, so what, yes, lockpick, iPhone chip, yes, securing papers, um, phone card ejector, photo hangers, ah, that's a good one, as a decoration, clip papers, uh, picking a lock, keyboard cleaner, ah, that's a new one, I haven't seen that very often, poke a hole in something, earring, yes, what else, jewelry, a hair clip, yeah, all right. Now you'll notice that as, as we continue here, there's an onslaught of ideas being entered into the Mentimeter. And oh, emerge, holding emergency clothing hanger. What was that? Hold, clothes, yep, reset electronics, lock picker, hold paper, emergency clothing kit, kit clip, voila, I, I found it. Scratching things, yes. A bookmark, a cleaning tool. Those are all excellent ideas. And you may have noticed that the very first ones were kind of the obvious ones, were they not? And as time went on, we've become far more creative in what with the answers that you have been submitting. And basically the idea is that we're just trying to get our brains warmed up and, um, and, and find out, you really get ourselves thinking and trying to be more and more creative. And as the obvious answers or solutions were being eliminated, we were being forced to become more creative in our thinking. So that was our first exercise. Um, and that really does lead to this on, I, idea of where do we find our ideas? Where do our ideas come from? So moving on to the next exercise, I'd like you to now um, think about where was it that you had your last great idea? And if you could enter that into Mentimeter. And so where did you get that last uh, Oprah aha moment, if you were, if you will? Were you with anybody? Can you remember who you were with? Um, so maybe give us an idea of where that might have been. So we have in nature, usually in the shower, at work, <laughs> the toilet, which I think was the toilet, uh, the park while reading, in nature, on a walk in bed. So it's going to be interesting. Yesterday while stretching. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, we've been doing an awful lot of sitting for the last year, haven't we? In fact, uh, last week I heard here in the US, the media, they announced that the average weight gain during the pandemic has been 29.3 pounds, which I find hard to believe. Uh, I would have guessed probably about 15. But uh, yes, so stretching and walking. So just before going to sleep, uh, in bed falling asleep. It's interesting when we see some of these things, maybe they're just as our minds are starting to relax, which is interesting to me, certainly. So here are some, um, here are some imagery uh, to show you where some of the answers we've received beforehand. And you certainly have touched upon these as well. So certainly while outside walking in nature, um, the next one was while exercising, especially outside. I think for those of you who are runners, there's nothing better than going out on a run and just emptying your mind, if you will, and allowing space for the ideas to creep in. Uh, the next one is, well, music, listening to music. For some, music is definitely something that inspires us. And I saw this one up on our work cloud while reading. 
which, uh, which is great. Uh, certainly in the last year, I found I've had less and less time to read. So I'm making more and more of an effort to actually open something that's analog, such as a book, something physical to read and that helps. Here's another one while driving. I mean, many of us spend hours in our cars, right? Um, going to see clients and customers. So driving is a great one. And then um, for some, maybe we're inspired by incredible architecture. For those of us who've traveled all over the world and abroad, I mean, there's something so inspiring, isn't there? Or when you're in London or in Paris and, and other great cities. Um, certainly, I love Vancouver. I've been to Vancouver several times to visit with uh, Tracy and with Renee. And I have found going out there and going out to the island has been absolutely inspirational. And then lastly, what about the digital area? Um, certainly we are turning more and more to the digital world and certainly we've experienced that more and more uh, in particular over the last year. So if we look at some of these icons up here, um, you may be familiar with some of them or all of them, but of course, uh, podcasts, right? Uh, iTunes, TED Talks, Pinterest, Instagram. Um, that logo down at the bottom right hand side is called Curiosity. So I invite you to search that one out if it is unknown to you. But um, moving on here, then, think, then we need to think about this idea of um, where we get our ideas. And you already have um, given us some great ones and they have certainly shown up in this slide here. So what we're looking at here is Pechion did conduct a worldwide survey several years ago, and we asked that question exactly to um, folks. And um, I'd love for you to guess which one, you know, what percentage of folks decided that the commute was where they had their best idea or work, exercise, shower, or vacation. So if you could enter on your Mentimeter where you thought people thought uh, they had their best idea. So you can just vote actually. If you want to just want vote for one, that's fine too. So for many people, it's okay. So the commute, it, well, vacation's in the running still. So that's great. What I love about Mentimeter, especially in the work that I do with clients is it allows us to see individual responses. And as we know, averages do mask individual responses. So it's interesting to see exactly where the responses are coming in. So. Um, we have found it to be an exceedingly uh, helpful tool for us in our work here at Technion. Um, so we have commute, work, exercise, shower, vacation. Yep. So for this group, it would appear that shower is your, fir your first response. Okay. Well, we're, I'm going to share with you what our actual, uh, our actual uh, answers were that we, we were able to collect. So for 44%, it was the commute, interestingly enough. I don't know about you, but in the past year, having lost the commute, and I don't know how, what your state is in, in Vancouver, but certainly here in New Jersey, we have a mixed bag. We're still, predominantly, we are still working out of our homes remotely. Um, and certainly we're not, uh, a long commute is not something unusual for us. So. Quite frankly, I don't miss my hour and a half ride into Manhattan uh, each way. However, I do kind of miss that time. Um, I have found to sort of ramp up my thoughts for the day and also to just dial it down in the evening on the way home. So the commute was 44%. It was 30% for exercise. And then we went into vacation. Uh, and interestingly enough, 5% in the shower. And for most, that was quite, uh, for many of us, that was our first answer, right? Um, but the biggest surprise is to find out that only 1% of folks that had been surveyed had their last great idea at work, which is really quite sad, isn't it? To think that most of us are being paid for our ideas and to be creative and to think that maybe only 1% had that at work is really um, problematic, I would say. So moving on, I think what we also realize is the need for great ideas. We need to discuss our ideas and we can somehow realize that maybe uh, we can agree that some of our best ideas start as conversations. So if they started as conversations, how do we get better ideas? 
you know, how do we solve better problems when we think our idea is the right idea? And how do we have better conversations? Um, so that's what we want to do today is talk about how we can have some of these conversations and also talk about where do we go to find the answers when we want to solve our complex problems. So uh, moving on, where do we find answers? And uh, quite frankly, most of us do something that comes to us quite naturally in this day and age is we will quite likely just Google it, right? It's Google has become a verb, I'll just Google it. So interestingly enough, this slide or this screen, um, screenshot I took about, I wanna say just um, over a year ago, probably. No, actually, that's not true. I took it last July, now that I think about it. It was last July. As of last July, there were 65,800 Google searches in one second. I checked today to see what that number might be. And bear in mind, when we wrote this CEU three years ago, the original number was around 48,000. So in two, you know, two years, it went up 20,000. Now, having checked it today, today it was 90,652, which really speaks to the fact that we are really, really screen, really glued to our screens and more and more so. Um, we are spending more and more time in front of our computers and we are indeed searching for our answers online. Interestingly enough, that really accounts for about 3.5 billion searches a day. 76% um, of all searches on the internet are done on Google. And believe it or not, 16 to 20% of the results are actually brand new results. So, um, and then this one I found very interesting as well is that over 60% of searches are conducted from a mobile device, not from a laptop or a desktop computer. So I thought that was rather intriguing. Um, so we think about that. So thinking about Google, um, just I'm curious to know, which do you think is the most popular how-to question asked on Google? Is it how do you download a YouTube video? How to get pregnant? Uh, how to register to vote? How to tie a tie? Or how to lose weight? I'll just give you a second to answer that question. So we're still at lose weight. I think that's going and that's falling in line with our pandemic weight gain, isn't it? <laughs> YouTube videos, yeah. Okay, so the vast majority of uh, those of us in our virtual workshop room here to gathered here today think that it is how to lose weight. Well, interestingly enough, um, and I must confess that this one, I did not have time to update this morning, but when I did do it last, uh, last summer, the number one uh, question asked on Google, unsurprisingly, was how to register to vote. So given our rather tumultuous <laughs> year that we had, I guess that's not so surprising. So I do need to take a look and it'd be interesting to see what the new one is. But in years prior, in all honesty, it was usually how to tie a tie. That's typically the answer, then how to lose weight. So that's just uh, a little bit of uh, trivia for you. So moving along, we also search not only online for answers, but what about our, you know, our digital assistants such as Alexa? And we love to think, think about it. If you have an Alexa, I would love for you to ask Alexa, uh, not this very second, but next time you happen to interact with her, what is happiness? And interestingly enough, the answer that you get when you ask Alexa that question is, the answer is, Pharrell will be great at answering that. So it's interesting, is it not? The minute you go to something where you don't have a conversation, you're getting a set answer. So maybe it's not such a great answer, or maybe it's not the type of answer that we're looking for. But the truth is that as a society, we are turning more and more to social media to find our answers. And if we look at the number of um, social media searches, uh, it's, it's really quite astounding to see how people are turning there. So globally, individuals are spending 144 minutes a day on social media. 
We are looking for information and we're posing questions to our friends and our network. We also tend to surround ourselves with people who share the same point of view that we have. They are our quote friends after all. We are spending more time getting our answers and shaping our perspectives from social media. It's one of the top places we go to to get the news, which is interesting because maybe the view we're getting is maybe, maybe it's not fair and balanced. So we need to be very careful about where we go searching for our answers. And it was interesting, especially when it comes to the news. Um, this journalist from the New York Times, um, Farad Manju, several years ago, decided to give up um, going to uh, the internet to find his news. He, he, he stopped um, all, all media on, on his iPhone and on the internet for a period of three months. And during that time, he decided to subscribe to three newspapers or three written um, sources of media. One was the New York Times, of course, one was The Economist, and the third one um, escapes me just this moment. What he did find was that he was spending probably uh, over two hours a day reading. However, he, he was getting all that news in that two hour period of time. He found at the end of the day, he actually had more time on his hands. He was, he was finding that he was saving time by reading the actual newsprint. The other thing he realized was that by the time a story made it to the newspaper and was published, a certain amount of time had elapsed. So those, you know, that breaking news, believe it or not, if you subscribe to about 12 different news media outlets, um, you will probably get in excess of 50 news break alerts on your cell phone a day. So he found that in fact, by the time that those stories do get to the printed press, that by then there's been time put into them where journalists have been able to really collect all the facts and um, context has been, stories have been put into context. So um, for him, it was a very, very um, powerful experiment. And what he said was, real life is slow. It takes professionals time to figure out what happened and how it fits into context, which is indeed very important. So how might we um, think about solving tough problems? If we're getting our answers more quickly than ever, how might we solve these problems when Alexa nor Google have the answer? And this is where we're going to turn to design thinking because design thinking may help it, as, as it is focused on the user and on solving complex and really messy problems. So I'm just gonna play a clip here for you. Hi there. You seem to have lost sound. It started at the beginning, but now there's no sound. Hmm. It won't stop. Hold on. Um, it should play through because I've got it on original sound. Let me take it back to the beginning. Yeah, we could hear it right at the very beginning and then it just went away. Oh boy. Hmm. Oh. Okay, let's try something else. I'm gonna back up a slide, we'll try that. Unfortunately, we may have to miss that slide, but um, I'm sure many, it's all right, we'll try one more time and then otherwise we will move on. I'm sorry about that. Mm. 
No, no sound. All right, well, I'll just let it play through. Mm -hmm. Is there a link we could send everybody after? Yes. Yeah, okay, we can do that. seems to be the issue in lots of different webinar yeah. tools, getting the sound working. Okay, so I'm gonna just move on to the next slide because otherwise it's gonna not mean much to folks. And what we are gonna do, what we're, our big takeaway from um, that little clip from Stanford was really we wanna concentrate on two areas of, of thinking. Um, and they are divergent and convergent thinking. And for those of you who are designers are familiar with the design process, you'll know exactly what we're talking about. So we think of them as divergent thinking as something where we're exploring all the possibilities. So it's that, that brainstorm, right? And then convergent um, thinking is deciding what we're going to do. So we're gonna focus on um, divergent thinking right now and explore possibilities to help decide what we're gonna do. Um, and when we do that, the question is, do we give ourselves enough time to do so? Um, you know, that's always, that's always a challenge, right? We're always looking to do things quickly and as fast as possible, but we need to allow ourselves time to do these things. So let's take a look at um, context and empathy. There are two critical components to problem solving and design thinking are to understand the context of the problem and to have empathy for the user. So I'm going to ask you to actually very simply uh, on your piece of paper next to you, draw a sunset very quickly. So the next thing, once you finish your sunset, I'm gonna please draw the last sunset that you saw. So the first one was just draw a sunset. The second one is draw the last sunset that you saw. All right, so my question is, are they the same? Most likely they are not the same. Here we have some examples of what people drew. Uh, so on your left-hand side in the first column, that was the first one. And on the right-hand side, uh, again, that was their second one. So it shows you that the, an example, the top, the top row, then the yellow box, that was the generic sunset. And then the one on the right-hand side was the sunset that they saw on the beach. So context is everything, isn't it? It's, it's understanding the context of a problem. So um, we're going to move on to, um, th let's think back now to where you had your last great idea. As re you recall, um, sadly, according to our worldwide, our um, worldwide survey, it wasn't really in the office. Where were you? I mean, were you in the office? No, judging by all the answers that you entered into the word bubble, I don't think, granted, there were a lot of them coming in. I don't think I recalled anything about an office or at work in there. Maybe there might've been one or two, but the vast majority had to do um, 
when in moments where you were either relaxing or on vacation or running. So that was interesting. But this is what we have to think about is that we are all being paid to think and be creative. So um, thinking about that, do the spaces in which we work inspire us or do they drain us? We know that there are benefits of space, but um, what, do they, what do the people say about the space that they work in? And certainly over the last year, we've had plenty of time to reflect upon that as we've been pulled out of the traditional office and being forced to work remote, remotely. Let's explore now what that really means about where we can work and where we do our best work. So if we think back to your office, or if it's not your office, and I'd like you to think pre-pandemic, if you will, think back to what your typical office environment was like. And what we'd like to do next is really go through um, breaking up with that environment. We'd like you to write basically a breakup letter to your office. And if you have a wonderful office and you really enjoy working there and it really inspires you, great. If um, that's wonderful, but maybe you can think to a space that a client has described or a previous uh, place where you were employed and break up with that space. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna do this a little bit more creatively. We are gonna simply enter into Mentee. What are the reasons that you would want to break up with a dreary drab office environment? Or in fact, today, if you are working remotely and you don't wanna be working from home, why, you know, why do you want to break up from your place of work today? So if you can, wouldn't mind entering those into Menti, that would be great. Perfect. Not enough light. That's a great idea. Too many distractions. It's not you, it's me. Yeah, it's right. It's not challenging enough. It's a toxic environment. Wow. So these are all, yeah, HVAC, glass ceiling, okay? You do not inspire creativity, noisy neighbors, loud. Um, too dark, I can hear everybody, it's too political, yeah. No access to outside, too loud, no views, too quiet. It's always too hot or too cold, yeah. So these are all great reasons. Let me keep scrolling through. Um, the clothes I have to wear are too uncomfortable. Yeah, I know, aren't we all gonna be in for a shock when we have to pull out those clothes from my closet? I certainly have things I haven't worn in over a year. Um, it's messy, I don't have the tools I need. No fresh air, it's not progressive, not enough technique on furniture. We love that answer. So thank you for that, that is awesome. So there's a myriad of reasons why we find our work environments may not be inspiring and we're, uh, we're not able to be creative. So what's interesting really is to think about, you know, um, as we go through this idea of solving problems, um, you know, we've, we've looked at uh, context. And now we've, through this exercise, really built up some empathy and we're trying to have a better understanding of, of the person that we're, we're solving for, for, if you will. And uh, it's very interesting because Paul Bennett said something um, that it's not your job to walk in a room with the right answer, but with a great question. So as we're looking to solve problems, maybe we need to be more creative in how we ask questions. So we have an exercise that we're gonna introduce you to you called the five whys. So right now I'd like you to think about all the reasons you wanna break up with your office or that past office. And I'd like you to write down on your piece of paper, where is the ideal place for you to work? If you could pick any place in the world to work and where you would do your best work, what, where would that place be? and just write it down in the corner of your paper. All right, now, Tracy, are you ready? Tracy and I are going to demonstrate for you um, our exercise called the five whys. And this is something you would do with a partner or with a client or whomever you're trying to help solve problems for. So where would, where would you like to work in an ideal world, Tracy? In an ideal world, I would love to work outside. Outside, okay. Why? I, there, what I picture in my mind is nice weather, greenery, um, nature. Okay. 
Yeah. So why is nature important to you? It decreases stress. I feel more grounded. Mm -hmm. So what causes you stress? Mm. Deadlines. (laughs) Deadlines? Okay. So what... Um, Constraints. And that's part of it, maybe, because out, outside there's less constraints, you know, less boundaries. So why, why do you feel constrained? The boundaries of time and boundaries of space. Yeah. If that makes sense. <laughs> it's getting so abstract. Why is it only boundaries? Why boundaries, do you think? Like as far as what causes stress or, yeah, yeah. Uh, cause there's, there's less room to be, to go outside the box, to be creative. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Great. Thank you. <laughs> so we did the five whys and it's really interesting because she wanted to be outside because, um, it, it just was decreasing. And then, as, you know, the, the, it was just something that was, um, helped alleviate stress for her. And then by the time we got to the bottom of the exercise, it was because she needed room to be able to think creatively. So it's interesting that we went through that process and the real reason she wants to be outside is to be able to be that much more creative. So that's an example of the five whys. You can do it in three whys as well. But in this instance, we chose to do five wives. So it's a really great one. And it gets harder. As you saw, it gets harder and harder to answer the question why. But as and it's going back to the paperclip, right? That paperclip ex- exercise, um, it's really get delving down into the heart of the matter. And by the time you ask why the fifth time or ask that fifth question, you pretty much get to the true essence of the why. So thank you very much, Tracy, for um, helping me demonstrate that exercise. So that's something for you all to think about. And maybe um, you can ask a colleague this afternoon and just having shared, written down on your piece of paper, you can just go through that exercise after um, our time together today. So the next thing we're gonna talk about, I'm gonna share with you another tool, um, which is gonna help us understand um, a little bit more about how we can frame problem solving. But first of all, what we have covered so far is that we've talked about context and empathy and how they are essential to the discovery process. And we did that through the sunset exercise. Then we wanted to um, really seek to discover some more. And we did that through the process of writing the quote unquote breakup letter. And by the way, when we do this in person, that breakup letter usually takes a lot more time. With Menti, we're able to really get through it rather quickly. And then lastly, we wanted to ask questions by not provide, you know, but not provide the answers. So I, you know, I never really gave Tracy any answers. She was constantly, uh, it was only at the end that I kind of tied it up, if you will, in a nice little bow. So those are the three things we did. But now it's time for us really to talk about defining the problem, or um, we're going to talk about what we call the ideal state. Um, and I'm going to share with you this little diagram here and we we call this um sorry this diagram's formal name is the ishikawa diagram and for those of you who are familiar with uh, process improvement such as lean or six sigma you may have already seen this however we're going to take this diagram and use it in a little bit of a different way to map out some of our problems so when we talk about the cause and then the effect so the head, if you will, is considered where you put the problem or you could state the ideal state, if you will. It's critical to articulate after discovery because as in groups, we may not be really clear on what the true problem is. So it's really um, vital to truly define what are you solving for. Um, The bones are what we call the causes. These are the the blue boxes. In these blue boxes, this is where we put our big ideas. And then the smaller lines really are additional details that support these big ideas. So um, I'm gonna give you an example of how um, this can be used as a tool. 
And typically when we run this in, in a group together, we would say, okay, let's brainstorm. So I would ask you all to get out your post-it notes and we would have posters there and post-it notes and I'd ask you to brainstorm. And I'm gonna just simply give you an example of a brainstorming session that was done by a sales team. And this team was asked to um, think about what makes what makes for, um, you know, what were their goals gonna be? It says a great week at work, but actually I'm gonna, since uh, you can see these post-its, I'll say that it was actually referred to what were their goals gonna be for the year. And they were asked to really just generate all these ideas, which they did. And every person just threw them up on the wall on post-it notes. Afterwards, they were asked to go through all these post-its and then group them into groups. And these groups really became what we call those blue boxes. So for example, in, for the instance here, this was, oh, it is the ideal work week. Well, then I'll go back to that. But I think I have another, I might have another one for you. Okay, I do. All right. So let me just move forward to the, the, um, there, the team vision. There we go. They were asked to figure out what that vision and the goal was going to be for the year. And they regrouped all their post-it notes and landed into these buckets. One was revenue growth, one was people growth, the other one was inspiration, uh, distribution, working internationally and looking at scaling their, um, their, 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 their team efforts, if you will. Another example would be also to look at what goes into an ideal work week. And since we have talked about workplace, this is a lot more relevant to what we've been talking about today. But what goes into the ideal work week? And again, they brainstormed a group. In fact, I did this with a group at um, BuildX, actually. And this is what they came out with. What went into the ideal work week was that it's a week filled with successes and objectives and peace and teamwork and client focus. And under each of these uh, boxes or big, uh, these, these, uh, these bones, if you will, you had the individual ideas that fed into them. So. In order for something to be a success, there had to be a big project win, there had to be good news, they had to close a deal. Client focus meant that um, they were having successful presentations. So the FISH, if you will, is a great way of summarizing and really helping uh, identify the problem and then helping uh, gather your thoughts, brainstorm solutions, and then again, uh, grouping them so that you also have the visual that you end up with. So that's how we took what was a, a, a tool meant for Six Sigma and turned it into something that we felt could be applicable to solving problems. So um, as, as I conclude, that really brings us to the end of our, um, our presentation today. So my question for you and your last question on Mentimeter would be, how would you rate your interactive experience with this workshop? Well, that's great. That's wonderful. I think, you know, the funny thing is when we did this probably about six months ago, we might have had one or two outliers. Well, we have one outlier today, but it's interesting. I think we're all pretty much um, zoomed out. So the fact that most of you found that this was helpful and drew you into the content, thank you very much. And um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over and ask if there are any questions. Great. And if you, just as everyone kind of thinks about a couple of questions, I'll just um, uh, just remind everybody that, that I'll let you know that the next three seminars that we're going to be doing are going to be based on the post-COVID environment. After every presentation, we have sent out a survey to the, all the attendees, and overwhelmingly, we've been getting this question back in various forms. So the next three seminars are going to be focused on ergonomics in the post-COVID post uh, post environment, all the way to uh, what floor plans and workspaces are going to look like. So stay tuned as we have this three-part series coming up over the next uh, six weeks. With that, I will open it up to have any questions. You're welcome to either type it into the chat or uh, just simply uh, put yourself on unmute and we will um, look for the person who's speaking. Questions? Okay, well, I'd like to thank everybody for 
coming to, oh, did I see your hand go up, Tracy? Well, it's just me. I was just wondering, since we have Annette here and you know she's part of our work, workplace strategy team and she's she gathers lots of information from workshops she holds. I'm wondering, Annette, if there's any anything off the top of your head that you've seen it related to what Nolan was just saying about the upcoming presentations, if <laughs> the future, can you see the future? <laughs> Well, <laughs> I think everybody on this call is being asked the, that same question, are we not? You know, what is the workplace of the future and what does it really look like? And I think interestingly enough, when we went into this pandemic, I mean, you know, we were so focused on, okay, we've got to get everybody back in and we're going to have screens and we're going to move the furniture around and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And as a manufacturer, we saw so many requests come in, you know, please give us pricing for screens, this screens, that. And then the reality is, is that no, that didn't happen. People stayed home, they stayed remote. Um, and then in speaking with clients, you know, we were getting ready when we, when we published, I think back in July or August, the return to the office, we're waiting to see if we're going to be asked those questions. And again, certainly with the clients I work with, the, the, the body of clients I work with tend to be very large companies and they were not bringing their people back in. So uh, all of a sudden that that's kind of went on hold. However, the, the question became, what does that future workplace look like? Does this mean now that um, we're gonna have no more free address, it's gonna be fixed address? We hear a lot about the workplace becoming a destination, becoming a cultural hub. We do hear a lot about the hybrid solution. And I think what we've really done over the past year is do, do a lot of studying and listening, listening to our clients and finding out from them what is the solution that works best for them. And another the question is, you know, if it is hybrid, how do I know who to bring into the office? What determines who stays home? What determines who comes to work? Um, how do you handle that? And then I had one client in August, they were gung-ho, ready to go. They said, this is great. It gives us a great opportunity to really uh, reimagine our workplace. And they were very, very keen to turn everything into a collaboration um, area. And that was great. And then we ran a workshop and several of their employees said, but wait a minute, um, yeah, I still need dual monitor screens. I still need this, I need that. So that speaks to Nolan's point about ergonomics. And I think if you think about it, when, you know, when we look at workplace, the one thing that we all do, regardless of where we are, is every single day, there's some degree of focus work that we do. That we do. So we need to remember that we still need to uh, support that, no matter where we are. We have certainly realized that we do want to go back to the office um, for collaboration, for mentoring, for social interaction. There's so many reasons to go back. But also, if you look at the data that's being collected by various organizations and research groups, by and large, um, this, people have been quite happy working from home, interestingly enough. So what we need to think about is how are we going to get them back in and what does workplace, what does that office truly mean and what is the right solution? And what's right, right. the right solution for one company doesn't mean it's gonna be the right solution for somebody else. So right now we're really, really engaging with folks to find out what is their right fit. Uh, certainly there are lots of trends out there and I would say the trend is def looking like we're all going to be going to hybrid, but that's not the solution for everybody. Of course. That's well, right. hence, that's the, nice the, hence the discovery process, trying to ask the right questions and lots of questions, right? Exactly. It's a lot of questions. Exactly. And understanding who wants to come in. And I think in the beginning, we all thought that, you know, the, those who had entered the workforce recently were going to be thrilled that they didn't have to come in, but actually the data proved the complete opposite. Um, people at the beginning of their career want to be in the office. They want to be mentored. They want to have social interaction. And, um, and then we also have realized that home environments are not ideal. Those folks who've done especially well at home are folks who have a dedicated office room within, within the home that allows them to work from home. Um, but then we have to recognize there are folks who are sitting on a sofa and that's not a good thing either. 
So um, there, there are, you know, there's no one set answer. And it goes back to, yes, we have all these wonderful averages, but, but behind that average, you have to look and see where those individual answers are, are lying. So it is, it's, it has been, uh, it's interesting. And I'm very excited to see what, where we are. What we do know is that most, you know, the trend was already starting to go to hybrid and work more and more remotely. Uh, what the pandemic did was really just set a, a level playing field. Everybody was forced into it. And certainly organizations that were hesitant about it were forced to really uh, think about it and uh, learn how to work that way. So it's interesting. Yeah. I have a question and from sure uh, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. so we have a question from Jennifer. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to make sure I was clear on the conclusion of this uh, webinar. Um, is it really about our current environments are really not conducive for ideation and discovery or just to help kind of implement some ideas on how to improve our discovery process? Thank you, Jennifer. That's a great question. No, the purpose of the workshop really is to share some ideas on how we can uh, go about solving some problems in different ways. And really, it's about sharing those tools. Um, you know, I'd like to think that most office environments are conducive to being creative, but we just happen to use the workplace as an example. Uh, but by and large, all these, uh, these, these tools were designed to be used for any, any, any question, really. But thank you for that question. Thank you. There, okay. There's a question in chat, too. Mm -hmm. uh, it just says, for the beginning stats, who was surveyed, U.S. only? Worldwide. Okay, excellent. Well, I'll see you all on the 8th when we talk about ergonomics in the post-COVID environment. It's going to be very interactive. Uh, I'd also like to extend the invitation to any of your significant others that would like to join that discussion because a lot of, uh, you know, we're in the industry, we get to talk about ergonomics from time to time, but people who aren't in our industry almost never get to be able to talk about it unless they get injured and they talk to an ergonomist. So feel free to invite your significant other to the upcoming ergonomics webinar. I promise it will be relevant whether you're working at home, working in the office or working in an office where you have to share your space with somebody else. Thank you everybody for joining today. We will see you on the next webinar. Thanks Annette. Thanks, bye-bye. Good to see you.